All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. For those of you we haven't met before, my name's David. It's great to be with you this morning at Vintage. Uh, my family and I have been coming to Vintage for eight years or so. Um, a year 10, I think we get a watch or something like that, but uh, we get some kind of, or a percentage of tithe, I forget what it is, but um, it has been a morning already. Joellen was um, coming back from the airport this morning, so I had all four kids, uh, which side point, I love it when guys or dads are like, no, sorry, I can't come, I'm babysitting the kids this weekend, and you're like, they're your kids, you can't babysit them, okay? <laughs> ladies, ladies. That was, a, that was just a throw out there for some support uh, for, uh, for this. So. Uh, but anyway, so, they were, so uh, Rory's out back. I'm in here. They're, they're in one of the back rooms. Rory spills uh, like, uh, you know, boiling hot water on him. So I did what any good dad did. I called the attorney. And um, <laughs> you're not going to be getting that new building, I'll tell you that. So uh, good luck with that meeting. Um, but no, he's, he's doing all right. And uh, Tuolum was able to get back to take care of them. So we are... Diving into Romans chapter 3, last week, if you were here, uh, Dustin was teaching on Romans chapter 2, the second half of that. He did an amazing job. He was dealing with the subject of circumcision, right? I think we'll all agree he did a great job. I told him afterwards it's a tricky subject, whichever way you slice it. And, uh, and that's, I've been waiting three years to tell that joke, and that's all you'll remember from this morning. But, um, but um, he did a great job. Romans, I, you know, I told the team, let's do the Gospel of John, but they said, no, 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 let's do Romans. This is not the kind of book you teach from if your goal is to, like, grow a church really quickly, right? This is the kind of stuff that we often resist and, and just sort of flick through the book like this and get to the other stuff, right? But there is something in this book that is so essential for us to grab onto as followers of Jesus. Remember when I taught a couple of weeks ago, I said that we are dealing with some hard subjects in Romans 1 through 3 that we have to understand that it's like a, a musical piece where the, the base note of grace has already been set. And if we don't notice that grace note and that the, 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 the Romans chapter 1 says, I'm not ashamed of the uh, gospel of Christ, it is the salvation to all who believe. If we don't set the right base note, then we hear all this noise about sin and judgment and all this stuff, and we miss the deeper message that is going on. And so this morning in Romans chapter 3, we're going to be learning about the power of sin, but we have to see it through the lens of understanding the power of grace. It is like in 2 Kings when the people of Israel are being surrounded by the Arameans, if, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and Elijah and the servant is afraid and scared, and Elijah says, Lord, would you open his eyes? And he can see now horses and chariots of fire, these angels surrounding the land. And that is an essential thing for us to remember as followers of Jesus that even as we this morning engage the power of sin, we have to remember that surrounding us all these chariots of fire is the power of grace. Our lives have been devastated by the power of sin. You've experienced that in your own life. You've experienced that in the lives of those that you love. And I am grateful, I am grateful that we have a God who is prepared to tell us the truth about what sin will do. That as we said in, in, in Genesis, when God is speaking to Cain, he said, sin is crouching at the door. It is ready to what? To devour you. And even though these verses in Romans chapter 3 are hard and difficult and we want to skip them, and we are, no, we're not going to skip them, but even though we, we want to skip them, I am grateful for the reminder, the, the radical way that we have to address this stuff. And it is radical. Because for thousands of years, the way that men and women tried to address the power of sin was by following a set of laws and commandments that they were never able to keep. And Jesus says what they did was they washed the outside of the cup, but the problem was inside. It is an inside job. That's what the gospel is. It is an inside job. And in this passage, in this thing, yes, we see the challenge of, of the power of sin, but we also have to see it through the lens of the power of the grace of God. So Romans 3, we're going to be reading the first 20 verses. 
In the New Living Translation, it says this, then what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. True, some of them were unfaithful, but just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proved right in what you say. You will win your case in court. But, some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose. It helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? Some people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all, for we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise, no one is seeking God, all have turned away, all have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies, snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder, destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace, they have no fear of God at all. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. See, I told you I wanted somebody else to teach this, uh, this chapter. Um, There are a few places that I want to camp out in this morning, four of them. Number one, what have you been entrusted with? Number two, our opposition to God's judgment. Number three, how we devalue grace. And number four, how we are all guilty and how we all need Jesus. So what have you been entrusted with? Romans Romans 3, 1 and 2 says this, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. As we read throughout the Old Testament, we see in the people of God this group of people who are given great blessing, and yet they receive it as a burden and a curse. We see it that when God brings them out of slavery in Egypt after 400 years enslaved and they're wandering through the desert, it isn't long before they start longing for the chains of old. We learn from their story that it's often harder for us to live as free than it is to live enslaved. There is something about choosing this power of sin over our lives that we have to be confronted with. We see in that group of people how they're, they're brought out and God blesses them, right? They wake up in the morning and there is food on the ground, right? If you have young kids, you know this experience, right? You're like, oh, you know this, this feel. but they wake up in the morning, there is food on the ground and they begin to curse God for that food. See, God provided them food and sustenance, this manna from heaven that was intended to do what? Take them from a land of slavery to the promised land. It was straight shot, an 11-day journey. They took 40 days, 40 years. You see, you ever like pack for a road trip and you've got a bunch of snacks and the kids start complaining, why, we only have carrots and chips and all this stuff. And you're like, guys, it's like a 30-minute trip, all right? It's going to be Okay. But here's this people, they were the ones by their own disobedience went round and round and round and round in circles for 40 years and God provided this food. They woke up in the morning and there was food on the ground that God provided for them. It was an abundant blessing to sustain them and yet in a sense, figuratively in their hearts, it was like they trampled all over the blessing of God. But so often we see through scriptures that God provides a great blessing, he entrusts us with something, and we end up walking all over it and despising it. God provides, God sends to this people his own son, Jesus, and they have him crucified. There is a reality in this passage that we have to understand. These, this group of people we're being challenged by, you were entrusted with what? With the whole revelation of God. And yet they are asking the question, is there any benefit to this stuff? Is there any advantage? 
they're asking these selfish, self-centered questions. And church, what I want to challenge us this morning is to consider this. What have you, what have I been entrusted with? That you wake up in the morning and you are surrounded by blessing. That you did not work for, that you did not provide. You wake up in the morning and to sustain you for the day ahead, you are surrounded by blessing on the ground. And yet so often we trample all over it. Looking for something else. There's this reality here in the scriptures where it says that in Romans 3 that they were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. This was something that mattered to Paul. Many years earlier, he in Rome had stood on the sidelines as a man called Stephen, who was a follower of Jesus, was talking to the Sanhedrin, the, the ruler, the governorship there, about Jesus. He was sharing with them the entire the story of God. And Stephen cries out before the Sanhedrin. He says, we, we Jews, we have received the life-giving oracles of God. We have received the whole revelation from God. It is this gift that is here to be shared with the world. And the people who heard Stephen speak picked up stones and stoned him to death. And it says in the story in Acts that a man stood on the sidelines And this man was Paul. You see, before Paul was ever confronted with the grace of Jesus, he had that same posture towards those who were following Jesus. But I don't think that image ever left his mind. He saw what a man was prepared to lose for the oracles of God, the revelation of God. It was valuable. It mattered to him. And so, church, the the challenge from this text is first to see the essential, the the beautiful gift and almost advantage, the unfair advantage of what it looks like to receive revelation from God. We're out here crying, as we should be, but crying out for revival and we're failing to be obedient to the revelation that we've already received. And there's this invitation for us to consider, church, what have you been entrusted to care for? The scriptures say, walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. Too many of us are running in someone else's calling. We're looking over the fence, we're saying, and we're saying things like, man, if I had that person's bank account, I'd be managing it better than them. If I had that person's family, that person's house, that person's car, that person's accent, I know, it's a, je- it's a jealousy, church. It's a jealousy. No. No. Um, if you, it's all fake, I'm from the South, but um, it's, there's, a, there's a, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20, he says, Timothy, God, what has been entrusted to your care, turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Church, you and I have been entrusted with something. It is the, the grace, the mercy, the love of God, and you have been entrusted with it, and I have been entrusted with it. And sometimes we wake up in the morning and we trample all over it. We see it in the parable of the talents, right? In Matthew 25, the master gives him, uh, gives five talents to one, two talents to another, one talent to the third servant. And the third servant, the, the master returns and the third servant simply buried a hole, uh, d- dug a hole and buried it because he was afraid. He buried what he had been entrusted with. You might say, well, he was only given one and the other one was given five. Isn't that unfair? If this third servant had been given five, he simply would have had to dig a bigger hole, (laughs) right? It is not about what you have been given. It is about whether you are caring for what you have been entrusted with. And you and I have been entrusted with grace. We've been entrusted with people. We've been entrusted with resources. We've been entrusted with jobs, with family, with bosses, with kids, with with vision with talents, with heart. We've been entrusted with all these things and Paul writes to Timothy and he says this to us today, would you guard what you have been entrusted with? The the word in the Greek says, guard what has been deposited within you. It's like getting a notification from your bank, like, hey, more money just went in. Something was deposited inside of you and the invitation is for us to care for what we have been entrusted with. He goes on in verses four through six, even if 
everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the Scriptures say about Him, you will be proved right in what you say. You will win your case in court. But, some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair, then, for Him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would He be qualified to judge the world? Let me ask you this. Has your sinfulness ever served a good purpose? It's destroyed a lot of lives. We sometimes read Romans through the lens of we're looking for an angry God. Does that make sense? We're looking for a God who's really angry with us. I actually find in Romans a very compassionate God who loves us so much that He's prepared to tell us the truth. That this sin, this power of sin, will devour and degrade and destroy. Jesus says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And so there's a, first of all, just a reminder of what sin has done in our lives and how that turns us to Jesus. But then it says this, this group of people, they're dealing with the fact that they've been pointing fingers at each other, the Jews at the Gentiles, the Gentiles at the Jews, and then they both unite over the fact, hey, why don't we point our fingers up at God? You see, these, this people, they didn't have a problem with judgment. They just wanted to make sure they were the ones doing the judging. They were very, very comfortable being judged judges, they were very uncomfortable being judged. And there's a reality in Romans chapters 1 through 3 where we we might force against it, we might not like it, but there is a reality going on where God is saying over and over again, these choices, this sin, these decisions, they have consequences that go far beyond your own life. And The reality is, again, is is not that we are against the idea of justice and judgment, is that we do not want God to be in that seat. And we have thousands of years of history, church, that says, you don't make a great judge, and I don't make a great judge. You know how often I judge people? All the time. At a four-way stop, tell me you haven't judged somebody at a four-way stop. (laughs) I'm serious. You know what I mean? You make, I make all these judgments. That moron... They don't know how to drive, but then when it's you, you're like, listen, you were wait. I, whoa, like I'm going. Yeah, okay. More sin happens at four-way stops. That's why we have roundabouts in England, all right? It, it's a sin measure um, or a sin reduction measure. Um, the reality is Jesus says this, to whom much is given, much is expected. And we said before, you have been entrusted with the entire revelation of God. You've been entrusted with with grace. You've been entrusted with mercy, with talents and heart. When Jesus says to whom much is given, much is expected, the reality is is that there are expectations set on those to whom things are entrusted. Because it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Him. And it is intended to multiply and be for the goodness of others. And how many times have we received the grace of God, received the blessing from God? It's like we wake up in the morning and the ground is covered in manna. And we, next morning we wake up a little earlier to make sure we beat everybody to it. Because we deal with this way of like hoarding and gathering these things to ourselves. And there's a reality that, said that there is a, an expectation placed upon us. And there is an expectation that we don't simply look at this power of sin and just say, it doesn't really matter. Church, Romans, imagine you never even read Romans and let me ask you, hey, what impact has sin had in your life? You ever meet anybody who at the end of their life is like, I just wish I got a little more sin in. I just ran out of time. I had plans. And Jesus in the gospel, Jesus gets really radical about this for his disciples. Remember, this kind of passage, this thing is like, is Romans 3 can be this really nice like self-righteous thing where we sort of point it outwards. It's written to a church. And Jesus in Matthew 5, he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to those who have called him rabbi. Jesus will say elsewhere, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet not do the things that I say? We, like, we can choose to live under the power of sin or we can choose to live under the power of Jesus. 
but we have to, we are making a conscious decision to call him Lord, to surrender our lives to him. And in Matthew 5, he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. That's like a vile, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. He's using this Greek word Gehenna. It's this place, this valley to the south and west of Israel that was used as like a trash heap where trash was burned. And it's also a symbol of, of hell more broadly. But the reality is he's speaking to to his disciples, and he's saying, listen, you can either be radical with this stuff or you will end up on a trash heap. It will destroy your life. And he's saying that back then, you see, the reality is back then, Gehenna, the trash heap was outside the city. We live in an era in 2022 where the trash heap has, has come into the city. It is the city. And Jesus is saying, you can be radical about this stuff or you will end up, there is compassion in his voice. See, it sounds pretty radical, right, to say, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, right? I don't think he's being literal in that case, but if you think so, go ahead. But um, I think what he's saying is this, is listen, if you pursue this thing and if you come under the power of sin for your entire life, then by the end of your life, you will look back and say, you know what, I lost far more than a hand. I lost far more, I lost the things that I loved, I lost the things that I was entrusted to care for. And so church, we have to get radical about this stuff, not from a place of religious, please do not become religious, it is, but from a place of where we come under grace. He says this, Romans 3, verses seven and eight, he says, but someone might argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? Some people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. There's a reality where sometimes we can devalue grace in our lives, right? As I said before, we can sort of walk all over it. And that's what these people were doing. They were treating sin. Again, this, isn't, this passage isn't about the pain that sin causes God, right? He's not there being like, ouch, would you cut it out? It's hurt, ouch, no, that hurts. He's saying, this is destroying you. Romans 6, 23 will say the wages of sin is death. You wouldn't show up to work at a place that paid, would you? I mean, if you went by Chick-fil-A and they're like, we're hiring, starting wage, death, right? Now, some of you are like, does it come with the Chick-fil-A sauce? Because, you know, it's, that's how you die, okay? That's how you die. No, but there's a, there's a reality where we devalue grace. And I think sometimes we step out from under the umbrella of grace and we, we then suddenly realize how much grace was being shown in our lives. Romans 3, verses 9, 20, it says this. This is, a, this is kind of a tricky, sub, tricky passage, but here we go. Um, Greg will explain it next week. But uh, it says, <laughs> well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all, for we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. The scriptures say no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. This passage is going after self-righteousness. It's going after the fact that we are all guilty. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm guilty. Turn to your neighbor, verse 13, and say, your breath smells like the stench from an open grave. <laughs> Snake venom drips from your lips. Try it. Let me, let me know how it goes. Um, the, the reality is, is that this passage is to remind us that this is written to a church. This is not written to a group of unbelievers. This is written to a church for us to understand, God, this thing continues, continues to have power over my life. And I'm guilty. And the reality is so many of us, we, we spend so much of our lives, I know I do, running from this guilt because we, we are convinced that it's just gonna, we're just gonna get shamed and cast out and, and end up like, like cast out on the rubbish heap. 
But the invitation of the gospel is very different. Paul goes on in verses 21 to 22. He says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. There is a, um, there's a thing in all of us, at least in me, where we find out we're guilty, but then we take it upon ourselves to say, well, if I just behave a certain way, if I just understand all the different laws and find myself like doing all these things in the right way, then I'm gonna be okay. And I'm gonna be able to say like, hey, I, I kind of overcame this powerful thing. But Romans 3 is not intended to make us sort of armor up. It's intended to invite us to surrender. To say, God, this, the, the power of sin is so strong in my life. Would you open my eyes to see that just like Elijah and the servant, that this valley is surrounded by horses and chariots of fire, which is the power of grace. Which is to say that when Jesus came and was speaking to the Pharisees, those were those who had kept the law. Remember the ruler who comes to him and says, hey Jesus, I've kept every single law. I've kept them all. Now what do you want me to do? And Jesus says, Jesus speaks right to his heart. He says, I want you to sell everything and come follow me. Why? Because you've spent your life grabbing hold of accomplishments and achievements. I've kept this law. I've kept that law. I've never, I've never done that. I've never done that. And he says, you need to let go of all those things. This is not an invitation to perform for God. This is an invitation to surrender to God. And he says that we... We cannot be made right by keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. It's just another reminder for us that for us to navigate this world with the blessing and the grace of God in our lives, it is gonna require us to have a face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus. And somehow that's harder. I, at times it feels so hard. It just feels like, can't you just give me a checklist of stuff? Can't you just give me like a behavior list? Because it feels great. I feel self-righteous. I get to look down on everybody else. I get to do what the Jews were doing, what the Gentiles were doing. And if, if, I can't, if Paul says you can't judge them, it's like, well, I'm going to judge God. Who's he to judge me? He's unfair. But the invitation of Romans chapter three is to say the, the only way to navigate this life in a way that sin is not empowering me and is not over me and is not controlling me is to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. A Jesus who says, hey, I know this sin is powerful, but I'm more powerful. I know that the the law has been this burden over you. It's been this pharisaical tradition that says here are the 613 or 630, whatever it is, laws um, that you need to keep. And Jesus comes and he says, come to me. He says, my, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. And, and sometimes we think that the way to be free is to be free of anybody's lordship, free of any control. And Jesus says, no, the, the way to experience fr true freedom is to come under my governance, to come under my power, to come under my grace. Let's stand together. Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you, Spirit, that you would teach us and convict us and help us and guide us and encourage us. We we need to hear your voice in that. How do these verses, how do these words apply to us? But together as a people, we just, we come and we say, God, you have entrusted us with things. And God, it blows our minds that you would trust us with grace, with people, with love, with mercy, with jobs, with finances. And we come before you this morning and say, God, for you to entrust us, we want to come under your lordship.
Say, God, you are our Lord. You are our King. We don't simply sing, Hail King Jesus. We live in that posture. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Dismissed. Thank you.